All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today. It's always good to have uh, Guy McPherson, PhD, in the house today. How are you doing today, Guy? Practically perfect in every way, thanks. Oh, the, that's a line from Mary Poppins, a film I've never seen. All right. Copyright, <laughs> D- Disney, 1968. Um, right. So... What's going on? You stay in, uh, you're obviously the world is going down in flames. We're on this sinking ship. We're all trying to do the best we can with, uh, with what we got. How, how's your mental stability doing in these times? Well, I'm happy to have you notice that the, that things are really falling apart <laughs> because many times every day i receive an email calling me names and telling me there's no way this could happen to our species oh please humans are just way too smart and so i point out that at least eight previous species of of the genus homo have gone extinct because of climate change but nothing no crickets right yeah exactly as if it's so uh, difficult to understand that even what we're just like I've heard numbers up to ninety six percent of all wildlife is going to be from nineteen hundred to twenty thirty is going to be wiped out. Um, are are biologists just liars, or or is everybody just stupid? Well, I think there's a few things going on here. One, government officials, media personalities, and paid climate scientists will not tell you a thing about what's going on. And when asked, they'll deny that we're in the midst of a mass extinction event. It's not the sixth, by the way, it's at least the ninth mass extinction event in in the last 2 billion years. And so a lot of people just deny that that's what's going on in the world. Because if you take the route I took, you, you have the potential to lose a lot of privilege. I know all about this. There's a coordinated defamation campaign that was catastrophic in terms of my ability to get this message out. Wow. So thanks again for having this conversation because a lot of people just won't have this conversation. In fact, if I get an email message like I did from you asking me to go on a podcast or whatever, the person who sends the email will within half an hour receive a message saying, you don't want to have this guy. You don't want to have this guy in an interview or give a tour or anything like that. Wow. Wow. Yes. And it happens like that. Public enemy number one. Well, you're lucky we're moving into an era where this is actually a good thing, I think, because a lot of people are getting turned on to the idea that, hey, something's fucked up here and the politics are all bad and everybody's upset, everybody's angry. And so somebody that's, you know, hated or whatever. It's like, don't interview this guy. Come on. That's exactly who I want to interview. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I don't hear that much, but whatever. <laughs> what, what do I, what do I quite the, over here? It's uh, quite the debate. Turning this shit slowly. This, well, <laughs> this is what they do. Well, and that's my perspective you know, at this and point. It's is understandable I have essentially nothing in the to midst lose. of a crisis you want to solve. Yeah. Most members of my family won't speak to me anymore. I have a beautiful woman who's in my life, a few friends. A few people who respect me. What else do I need? Yeah. Oh, I need lunch. That's right. Yeah, don't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> Nutritious lunch. Um, yeah, but you, you're talking about extinction and, and people going extinct from uh, human causes. Have you? Can we talk a little bit about what have you heard about microplastics? It's a big thing going on. Microplastics. Oh is yeah. What, what, what is it? It's. It comprises more than 50% of most beaches in the world. Holy shit. What, what you think is sand, if you take a close look, is actually microplastics. Microplastics are plastics that have broken down, and they fill the ocean now. Obviously, they're on all those beaches. They're filling the ocean. They're filling you. It, every day, we eat a credit card's worth of plastics. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not recommending you eat your credit card, by the way. I that's, tried, and it's just yeah. <laughs> but that's the that's the volume of plastic we're ingesting every day, and it, that can't be good for you. Mm, no, I no. mean, I'm no medical doctor. But I've been with you. <laughs> I, I ain't no scientist, but I do believe. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I think I interviewed the guy, uh, Dr. Paolo Nassami or whatever. He did the study for the WWF saying that we're eating about a credit card's worth of microplastics. And you were talking about, you know, denialists and people that come in that are paid to deny these these basic facts. I had somebody, as I'm interviewing this guy, get in touch with me from a polymer institute, right? They, it, the study of plastic, the plastic industry basically came after me and said, you don't want to interview this guy. No, no, no. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I said, well, you come on my show and debate the guy. Said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, some people can't handle the truth. I mean, we're talking about endocrine disrupting sort of uh, components to microplastics when they break down. Mm -hmm. And then I've, people I've heard birds not developing the wingspan that they need in order to fly south for the winter, for instance. Uh, and we love plastics. Humans, we love everything's got to be in a fucking plastic bag. Did you ever see The Graduate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 1973, I think it came out. And there's this, there's this great scene where this this man pulls – I'm sure that man is dead by now because he was pretty old at the time. And he pulls Dustin off, Hoffman. Is that who was in it? Dustin Hoffman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The young Dustin guy Hoffman. at the time, yeah. Pulls him off to the side and he says, plastics. And Dustin Hoffman goes, what? Plastics, son. They're the future. <laughs> well, that was 1973 and here we are more than 50 years later. And, yeah. and it turns out they were the future at the time. Yeah. Now they're accountable for the past. Don't you think that this, these type of inventions, so, oh, we could like the plastic bag or even an artificial heart valve that's made out of plastic. Don't you think that these just balloon up the population in a way that's unsus unsustainable? Like, yeah, maybe it saved lives or whatever, but at the end of the day. Of course. That... Of course. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many people, including fellow faculty members, when I was on campus at the University of Arizona, people would come up and tell me all the time, I'm only having two children because that's self-replacement. No, it's not, by the way. So for replacement is about 1.8 because each, gener each generation lives longer and consumes more materials than the previous generation. So try having 1.8 kids, though. <laughs> People give you funny looks. <laughs> now, this is, our, this is our little baby, just a pair of legs. <laughs> we, got, we got a new one. He's just from the waist down. Wanted to keep it under two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I wonder what that's like for the woman pushing out half of <laughs> But yeah. So replacement, like what Carlin say, George Carlin said something, a replacement for yourself, just one. Right. Don't even replace your, your husband. Fuck him. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, funny man and incredibly... Intelligent. Yeah. God bless articulate. him. God very rest his few, soul. Very few people understand the English language as well as he did. Yeah. Right? He would just go on this riff about how we use these words. It was incredible. Yeah. Oh, I love the aspect when, you know, they do this now. You know, back in the day when you're in the mental institution, they'd call you uh, uh, an imbecile or an idiot, right? Mm -hmm. They just, they would, then they would send anybody here. And that was a medical term. And then idiot got co opted by people and say, well, you're one of those idiots down at the place or whatever. And then that became derogatory. So we had to change that. And then it was re retarded. That was the new medical lingo. And then we moved on from there. And now we can't, you call... can't call somebody retarded anymore, by the way. Yeah, I can. Well, I've heard, I've heard young people call themselves retarded. And I, I'm glad that they still do because there's no point in keeping like redressing language. But at the yeah, same and, time, and black people can call themselves the N word too. But right. you and I can't get away with that. <laughs> and and like words, like we're on a sinking ship, a big smoking ball of shit planet that's going down in flames. And yet how how we address each other in the language that we use is like the most important thing. And it is not the most important right. thing. Right. It's important. You know, I, but I have a lot of conversations like this with the relatively few people who will still talk with me. And... <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a complete transition of gener. I mean, in a single generation, right? When I was a, when I was a kid in school, okay, you, you might argue that, that was two generations ago. We called each other the most horrible things, <laughs> and retarded was a common word 
use yeah. to describe people. Now we use learning disabilities, right? We don't yeah. even use the R word anymore. Right. It, yeah. It's amazing to me that in this relatively short time, I mean, a human lifetime is really not a long time as much as it seems otherwise. Yeah. Well, so. we, dr we dress this up like it's progress, though, right? The, you, I know you talk a lot about progress and what the hell is it good for? And I agree with you. But this is another one of those useless kinds of progress. We're like, oh, we've changed things and it's better now. And it's not really better, is it? Uh, but wait a minute. Change is good, right? Oh, no. No, I've been saying for about 40 years, change is bad. You know, I can tell. <laughs> Well, I guess, you know what, are there some acceptable types of man-made change that we can say, oh, all right, hot water, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, BLTs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan. But the vegans who are watching this are going to come after me, I guarantee it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, I mean, I am a vegan now. I was once like you, my friend, BLT, a BLT every two hours just right in my vein <laughs> intravenously give me the bacon and um, and it is it's delicious and i i can't knock modern <laughs> cuisine like i'll eat indian food and it's not local or anything like that but i like mm -hmm. it so mm -hmm. right fuck off but all, most <laughs> other kinds of progress is is really something i mean shouldn't we look at every little bit of progress and really look at it closely before we let it just run free but here's the thing there's a professor. His name is Tim Garrett. He's at the University of Utah, and he has written five peer-reviewed papers indicating that civilization is a heat engine. No matter how you power it, I don't care if you put all the solar panels in the world up. I don't care if you use solar panels and wind turbines and a thousand other things, wave power, whatever. Civilization is a heat engine. It's civilization itself that is heating the planet. It doesn't really matter how we get there how we maintain this set of living arrangements, it's all a heat engine. Well, that's really inconvenient. So inconvenient, in fact, that he published that first paper in November, mm, 2012, maybe. Anyway, it's easy enough to look up. And, and he received such, the, the editor, after it was published, receives such feedback, such negative feedback, <laughs> that the paper was withdrawn. Because people, other faculty members said, I'm civilized. It can't be my fault. My whole community is civilized. It can't be our fault. You know, and so there were two responses written by two research labs at different universities that responded to his paper. And, and Tim Garrett was not allowed to fire back, was not allowed to respond to those two responses hmm. 13 months later. So the, so the paper was delayed by 13 months, it came out in February, the, you know, the year after the year after. Unbelievable. Yeah. After that, and, and these are people who call themselves scientists, hmm. right? Who are supposed to be objective and are capable of taking in new information and synthesizing it within their contemporary lives. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you, you've said, I mean, since you've learned that, that uh, the academia and science is just actually written with corruption in that way, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. And it's really inconvenient when you're part of that institution. And I would argue that I, I still am even though I'm emeritus, retired with honors, I'm still, you know, I still publish peer-reviewed papers. I'm not on campus teaching anymore, obviously, because there's the only campus here in Bellows Falls, Bellows Falls, Vermont, is at the high school and the middle school. <laughs> I'm <Is> not that... <laughs> Sounds nice. It's small... If it's a small enough town, if there's no fucking people and it's mostly trees, I'm in. Yes, and that, that's the case. <laughs> partner Pauline and I live on a road that dead ends at the municipal water supply. And she spends almost every school day, they have this week off, but she spends almost every school day substitute teaching on campus. And she comes home 
and for an for two hours she rants and raves and talks about how horrible those children are and their parents must be even worse. <laughs> anyway, well, at least that's what I hear. <laughs> she, she she says in retrospect that the kids are the good ones and the sure. parents must have problems. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I'm like vast political differences with all the kids and like just horrible values, I'm guessing, right? Well, and they spend most of their time, most of their time trying to pick on each other, mm. beating each other up, you know. <sighs> was that different when we grew up? Was it different? Well, it was at least for me because you couldn't talk in the classroom without teacher's permission. Oh, right. Right? I mean, now – these kids think they're in charge of the whole show and they got the teachers outnumbered. So <laughs> that's a recipe for disaster right there. Well, it's pretty amazing. You know, in, in just a generation or two, we go from, I, I would never open my mouth in the classroom. Never. Yeah. It, and it, it became so taboo that I wouldn't, I wouldn't even raise my hand to ask a question, right? I was just terrified of these teachers because they had the power. They were the ones in control. Oh, and by the way, if they sent me to the principal's office, that was my dad. So that was inconvenient. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. That's, that's, not, that's not easy. It, it's pretty interesting. I never told him this story. And he's dead now, so you'll never hear it. <laughs> there's there's a, a guy named Scott in my school, in my elementary school. It must have been fourth grade or thereabouts. And he was mean. He was just always picking on people, including me. And I'm walking with my best friend, walking around the schoolyard, and we come across Scott. And he says something nasty to me. So I punched him right in the face. <laughs> Mind you, he didn't punch first. I punched him in the face just for whatever he said. And then, of course, we had to go to the principal's office. And my friend and I just lied about it. No, we didn't. Nice. No, we hit him. I don't know why he's got that blood running down his face. <laughs> hey, there's That's the real essence of how the world works right there. It's like you just... <laughs> You fuck people if you think you can get away with it. That's like, you're like a real human being, you know? Oh, and then, and then I, I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I knew it was a bad thing. My dad, the principal says, all of you are on my blacklist now. Uh oh. I might still be on his blacklist. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Yeah. But, but I knew it was bad. I was on, a, on his blacklist, so I better not go punching other people. <laughs> That blacklist isn't so bad. All those nice Hollywood stars from the 50s that were on that black, right. communist blacklist. That's okay. Yes. They were nice. Right. Yeah, I was shit. a little bit later than that, by the way. My mom, it was the shit list. You know, That's, <laughs> I mean, that might be worse. I have no idea. You're on my shit list today. Um, but yeah, I mean, isn't that par for the course for human behavior? I mean... I grew up, it was a little bit similar. It was like a primitive sort of Lord of the Flies experience when I went to school among the kids. And like there was thoughtful kids who really were interested in cool stuff and they were kind of nerdy and, and nice and polite and shy. And then there, there was these other ones that were just sweaty, you know, you know, knuckle dragging the ground, you know, hairy knuckled kind of <laughs> troglodyte kids. <laughs> Who were always looking for a fight, and uh, and yeah, I was just I was glad to get the hell out of there. And that, by, after your time, you know, they started putting fucking police in schools, and then everything got worse. And then Pepsi oh, yeah. machines. Oh my god! Well, and not just police in the schools, but scanners, right? Airport oh, scanners. Right. You couldn't carry guns and knives in. You Darn. know. <laughs> I never knew a time when my dad didn't have a pocket knife in his pocket. And it was always sharp enough that he could shave the hair off his arm. Ooh. He just 
held himself to that high standard all the time. So when I was a kid, everybody carried a pocket knife. It was just no big deal. I remember sitting there in classrooms and kids are cleaning their fingernails and, and cutting their fingernails with their knives. They brought in, the, and you can't do that anymore. Yeah. In fact, my dad was the superintendent of schools at, at a place, we, another small town. We moved from a village to a smaller town between my junior and senior years in high school, between 11th grade and 12th grade. And so we're at the new school and federal law no longer allows any kind of weapon on campus. Got no guns, no knives, nothing. And it all happened very quickly, pretty much overnight. Well, my dad knew if he actually enforced that thing, he'd get run out of town. Wow. Every day in the fall, in the autumn, kids would go to class and they'd have gun racks with guns because they're going hunting right after school. Wow. Right? That's just what we did. It was a village. Everybody knew that you went hunting after school unless you were on the football team. <laughs> and some and somehow the, the kids killed each other less in those days. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Total access to all the guns and knives, right? And nobody's killing each other. Yeah. We think, you know, in Europe, when you go to a train station and it's like this, you know, in America, if you're in public, it's just like a dirty, shitty experience. And they give you, if you go to a place, they give you a plastic fork and a plastic cup because they don't trust you with like silverware and stuff like that. In Europe, they actually give you silverware, you know, what you can drink when you're 16 or whatever. They kind of trust you to, to be okay. We'll give you the freedom to do it. Don't fuck it up. And if you do, you'll be in trouble. And I think for that, people are more civilized. Like, I think the more taboo you make shit, uh, Ab mental absolutely. health goes down. You think so? Right. Absolutely. Also, you know, since World War II, Western Europe has done so many things differently than the United States. For example, when it comes to almost every aspect of our lives, in Western Europe, they penalize bad behavior and reward good behavior. So people get rewarded for not driving a car, for taking public transportation. They have this huge tra transportation network for the public, right? Mm. Look around in this country. You can't find an Amtrak that's functional anywhere except in the Northeast United States, where there's about four or five lines that can get you from one place to another. Right? Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. I grew up in Idaho and I never even knew there was such a thing as public transportation. Right. Buses, not in the village I grew up in. <laughs> I mean, did your parents though have, I mean, at one point America was like trains, right? Is it like 150 years ago? It was trains. You know, you know, the city in the United States that once had the largest, best developed light rail system in the world, Los Angeles, huh. Los Angeles, California. And of course the federal government had to fix that. You know, the old expression, if it ain't fixed till, if you, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, fix it till it is. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that one. So this is why every large city in the United States, which used to have light rail systems or horse and buggies coming into town. That's why now they they all have interstates going into them and rings of interstates around so that the people who are driving within the town don't have to drive through town. They can go around right. on these on these big loops, right? And well, Los Angeles had this well-developed public transportation system in the 1920s. And so here we are 100 years later, Everybody's got a car. There are more registered cars in this country than there are people licensed to drive them. Yeah. Well, everybody's got five or six or whatever. Or... Right. Uh, just, what do you think? They it, call it a two-car garage. Oh, nobody right. has their car in their garage, whatever. Not enough room well, for it. They got all this other crap. Even if they cut down on the number of kids they're having, 1.8, they're still going to have 2.5 cars or whatever. So, Right. And the garage yeah. is so full of crap that they can't put a car in there anyway. Yeah. yeah. Stuff. I need stuff. Oh. I just got to keep having a place for my stuff. 
There's another George Carlin episode. Yeah. We always, I was going to tell you about the, uh, cause you say, well, we, everybody used to have a pocket knife and stuff like that. And there's like, they stopped doing that on planes too, right? They stopped allowing people to have basic sharp things, toothpaste, <laughs> lube, <laughs> take a, take some lube on a plane. You'll get to uh, mess with, but he's like, well, what about a guy with really big hands gets on a plane? <laughs> he could definitely choke a flight attendant. It shouldn't. I don't think they should let big guys with big hands on planes anymore. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Worried about a guy like me with toothpaste. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't. I don't even think that this is the progress thing. Are we, are we making progress? We're not making progress. We're we're making things change. Somebody told me recently about. They used to hang people in the town square, right? And everybody would cheer and there would be this big spectacle and stuff. And then oh, yeah. we think – we thought, oh, yeah, well, it's more humane if we move it outside of town. But really it's like less humane because nobody's there to give like a human feeling to the execution because when they hung people in the town square, sometimes there would be riots right afterwards where people were like – become overwhelmed with emotion and say – I can't believe they hung this fucking dude. Uh, let's burn down all the buildings in town. Uh, right. Our pro progress, progress. <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. And, and so that makes my he people, my heroes are like Charlie Manson and fucking Genghis Khan and, and uh, you know, the Unabomber. I'm like, these guys had a point or like Genghis Khan was like the biggest environmentalist in the history of the world. And, and, you know, Kaczynski was incredibly bright. Okay. I don't agree with his approach on the bottom line, but his manifesto, amazing. He, he obviously didn't know about the aerosol masking effect because no paid climate scientist will admit that it, it exists. But he wrote a book while he was in prison that was all about reducing our individual environmental footprint and doing that at scale so that we become a more decent nation and a more decent world. It was, it was amazing, an amazing book. Can't remember the name of it, long time ago. But he, you know, he had uh, an IQ of like 160, which is higher than Elon Musk. You know, he went to Harvard, went, just couldn't make it in, you know, as a kid, he would have uh, uh, his brothers and sisters pick out, you know, animals out of the yard and try to put them in cages and stuff. And he would get really upset and come over there and free the squirrel or whatever it was. And then, uh, and then he was always in tune with nature in that way. And then finally he saw that it was all bullshit with capitalism by the time he was in college. And he says, you know what, going out to the country, fuck all this. I'm going to eat bugs. <laughs> that was it. And then of course he would go for like a little walk every day to where the waterfall was and it was all pretty and beautiful. And, and then, uh, one day they just started building something, right? They would start paving a road through his little scenic spot. And he just sort of, you know, went a little cuckoo bananas. Right. right. Understandable, palpable <laughs> amount of anger, you know, you know, and at least he admitted he ate insects. Most of us eat insects all day, every day, because it's in the food we we think is clean. Oh yeah, rat droppings too. Mm. Right. Mm. There's all kinds of stuff we're eating. We just don't talk about it. Right. The the microplastics is one of the worst. I I was thinking about uh, asking you about some of the the most annoying little things that humans do, and for me, it's a uh, the stickers that they put on fruit. You know, it's a, ne <laughs> it's a, it's a never ending war with the little stickers. And every once in a while you get one where you do, you forgot to take it off and there it is. You just, you, you know what I do when, when I go to the store and I put fruit in the little bag or in the bag we take or in no yeah. bag at all. If it's bananas, I just yeah. take all those things off and put them elsewhere in the store. So that there's just one. <laughs> left on whatever I'm so I, I got I got 10 bananas I got one label on there because they need yeah. to scan the label right I want the fucking fruit I don't want the stickers here you keep the stickers I'll make you a deal somebody's buying bananas they got 38 stickers on one banana yeah 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 I think I've seen that too this lonely yeah. bunch of bananas that somebody has just pasted with all the stickers yeah um, that was me <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Right. God damn it. Um, yeah. 
And if it's not that, it's, it's you know, it's all the other plastic packaging I have to go through when I'm uh, undoing my groceries. And how that is one of the things when they talk about microplastics, it is disposable packaging that's doing it. Do you know who Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant was? Well, if I had a $50 bill, I could tell you. <laughs> right. Maybe so 50 bucks would refresh, refresh my memory. <laughs> so but, a well-known person, he was a United States president. You know what his definition of history was? And sometimes it applies to our individual lives or to, to, to the small community that we're in. Ulysses Grant's definition of history. Just one goddamn thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you were just talking about. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's my new favorite president. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I mean, uh, what, what's his name? Teddy. Oh, Teddy. He cared about nature, at least. He's, you know. Oh, yeah. Isn't that yeah. right? Yes, when he wasn't out killing every animal on the planet. Oh, he right. Was <laughs> passing laws to ensure that nature existed. <laughs> He's like, I killed the last Tasmanian tiger. I'm the winner. <laughs> it was a different time. <laughs> I mean, this was still, there was a naivety like, okay, there's plenty for everybody to be able to murder, right. you know. Right. We you don't know, have that luxury. And it was about that time he probably knew about the passenger pigeon. Passenger pigeons used to be so abundant, they would darken the sky. Wow. Right, they're flying overhead. There's so many of them, you can't see the sun anymore. Yeah, and we but shot the them out of existence. Primitive email system up in the sky. Right, right. And we killed them all. Uh, I mean, we probably didn't kill the last one. It died in the Cincinnati, Cincinnati Zoo. Oh, wow. It actually um, did. It's like a half a dozen species that the, the last individual of the species, the extinction of the species, when the, was in the Cincinnati Zoo. Did, my, did did we my breed message, them? My message, don't go to the Cincinnati Zoo. I don't care <laughs> if, you're, if you're paying your way in. Fuck no. And yeah, for everybody listening, fuck, fuck the zoo anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did they breed those into existence? Like, uh, because they could, you know, deliver job applications and shit? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. Nothing they would surprise must have. You know, they did the same thing with horses, right? They were like, well, as soon as the automobile was uh, invented, we took all the horses that we were using and we were just like, well, I'll just kill them, I guess, you know. You turn them into glue. Yeah, or sausages. Right. Yeah, but if we don't talk East about that. <laughs> if you're in Eastern Europe, yeah. <laughs> uh, or Mexico. Uh, you know, what's funny is in, in Europe, people eat, in some places in Europe, they eat horse and they definitely feed them in the most developed parts of Europe. They feed their dogs horse meat. And in the United States, we think that's blasphemy. You know? Yeah. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Because what's the difference between a horse and almost any other kind of livestock? Not much. Everybody eats cattle. I mean, not vegans, obviously not vegetarians, right. but a lot of people eat various kinds of cattle, yeah. but horses yeah. are out. This I is the know. speciesism. You're like the vegans got it right with the speciesism argument, where you're saying yeah. you're just being, you're just like saying, "Oh, this is different." It's not different. I I would eat a human being if if times got tough, uh, because people it's have. red meat. People <laughs> have, people have, and enjoyed when, it. When I go into a restaurant by myself, I make the reservation in the name of Donner, so that when they call, they can say Donner party of one. <laughs> Donner party, your table's ready. <laughs> yeah. You know, plain you crash. Know the Do you know about the oh, Donner party? Of course. Oh, okay. did, what, how, how many people did they eat? I, I have no idea. We don't talk about it on the air. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, uh, uh, these are like the pre Mormons that came over uh, through Utah, mm -hmm. right? They were like. Right. And they got to the Sierra Nevada range um, between Utah. No, between Nevada and Colorado or California, that other one, right? Oh, right, makes, right, right. Yeah, and that's did, uh, a tough time. They just got snowed in. Well, in the core of the core of discovery, led by Lewis and Clark, almost starved to death going across the Rocky Mountains because it was a biological desert for all practical purposes. And when they got to a place called the Weipe Prairie. I grew up in the village of Weipe. 
And and you would only know the town we I if you watched Ken Burns's Core of Discovery, right? Which is about Lewis and Clark and and the Core of Discovery. So they get to the We Prairie, they they meet Nez Perce Indians for the first time. And the Nez Perce Indians fed them abundantly. And I bet a few years later they realized that was a really bad idea. <laughs> They kept them alive. They fed them salmon. And salmon, of course, is incredibly rich. And so the whole cast of characters, I don't remember how many were in the core of, of, of Lewis and Clark's, but they would just engorge themselves. Mm. So rich, tasted so good. And then they would vomit. And then they would eat a bunch more. And then they would vomit some more because they were so desperately hungry. And this food was so rich, you know, they weren't going to pass it up. Wow. But maybe not eat it all in one bite. Right. The Roman style of eating, you know, eat as yeah. much as you can and then throw it all up. <laughs> wow. You think if they if they would have died out there, wouldn't that have been awesome for humanity? Or would they have just sent two other monkeys out there to, like, you know, <laughs> discover I'm, America? I'm sure they would have sent other monkeys. But, you know, the slower <laughs> we make it go... Right, the better. Yeah. I'm. I'm absolutely convinced that you and I would not be here were it not for World War One, World War Two, the Spanish flu, the the plague of a little over a hundred years ago. You know, mm. if there was not some means of um, getting rid of a large number of humans in a relatively mm -hmm. short period of time, then right. we'd have way too many people at this point. We would have had way too many people a hundred years ago, and we would have overpopulated the planet and destroyed everything. We're we're on that path right now, but imagine if we didn't have World War One and World War Two and the Spanish flu, the the play, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Had it not been been for those Romans killing all those Christians, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah, I'm not saying that it was a good idea to kill all those Christians, although. Sometimes, sure. you know. sometimes, sometimes you got <laughs> religious zealots. Come on. I mean, there's, as George Carlin said, there's no such thing as an innocent human being. <laughs> Your birth certificate is proof of guilt. Fuck you. <laughs> right. Well, here's the deal. Birth is a sexually transmitted disease that is proven fatal in every case. And you're telling me, you're telling me that's a good idea? <laughs> Not to mention, a, you know, a, a ball and chain that you wear for at least 18 years, if not your entire life. Um, but yeah, I mean, to propagate the species to no end. So vaccines, obviously, it's great that they work and they can help alleviate uh, suffering in people. But didn't vaccines just also help balloon our population up to unstable numbers? Absolutely. How could they not? That's what quite we do. <laughs> This is quite the debate. <laughs> this, this is what they do. You know, and it's understandable at the time when you're in the midst of a crisis, you want to solve the crisis. That's what humans do. We solve every crisis that comes along. Mostly we solve the crisis by killing people. But occasionally, killing a few people allows a whole bunch more people to live. And that's why we're in the mess we're in right now. So we're not anti-war in the philosophical sense, you know. In, right. in, in the uh, in the population sense or the ecological sense, but um, but yeah, I mean that's the unfortunate thing is that our we let our instincts sort of override the data that we we know is true. Like I mean, right. it, we get this a lot of talk about underpopulation. Have you heard about this? Oh yes. Oh, pretty much every day. <laughs> Well, okay, so what we have, have you heard? Have another, we have to have enough humans to carry on this uh, magnificence that is our species. Yeah, I think we're this close to losing us. Really? Are you kidding me? And and is it is, like I've heard Elon Musk say? Well, we've got uh, not enough people. Not enough people. We need more people. Blah blah blah. But we have the population still increasing. Is it not? Yes, it is. Oh, by the way, how many children does Elon Musk have? Like eight? 18, 10, 20? I don't know. I yeah. don't remember, but it's a lot. It's way more than self replacement. If if we're in danger of running out of humans, he's doing his part. Right. 
but we're not in danger of running out of humans. Yeah. So let's look at the first assumption there. <sighs> yeah. That doesn't seem accurate to me. And in fact, it even has like a little twinge of white supremacy when you say, well, we, we, we don't have enough white people in America. It's like, because uh, when he says there's not enough underpopulated, it says, dude, Nigeria is exploding. India is exploding. You could import all the talent you need to take care of your old, enfeebled uh, people that, you, that need the help. But that's not really what it's about. Is it? It's about skilled labor and it's about white people. You want well, good smart, talented, educated white people to come. And, uh, yeah, come on, be honest. And if they, you know, if I've overpopulation is a thing, then definitely they're talking about me because I am the one who's extra. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I never did. Do you, uh, do you know who Louis CK is? Oh yeah. He's favorite, big favorite. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So he has a skit about, being white, right? And how great it is to be white. Now, I'm not saying being white is better. I'm saying, no, I'm not saying white people are better. I'm saying being white is clearly better. <laughs> Who can even argue? Yeah. Put yeah, me in yeah. a time machine. I can go to any time. And if I'm white, right? I show, I don't even say I go to the year two. You put me in a time machine and I show up in the year two. I don't know anything about the year two, but I show up and somebody's going to say, we have a table for you right here, sir. Because I'm white. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much run the show the entire time since yeah. since the beginning. Um, what have we done to indigenous people since the first white person came along? Killed as many as we could as fast as we could. Yeah. And then refused to honor their existence. You think we're the most paranoid uh, race of people, just white Caucasian people? Do you think we're like extra paranoid because we love to kill people? At any time, at any, you know, give it to that guy just sneeze, kill him and kill his mother. Right. No, no, no. I, I think people are actually out to get me. What are you thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> Was that a knock at the door? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I try not to let it get to homicidal lengths or whatever. I'm going to genocide a whole bunch of people. But yeah, I have my moments as well where I think, oh, holy, holy Yo, God, they're all out to get me. Leave the genocide to United States presidents, right? Right. The the purveyor, the there. That's an all star team right there when it comes to genocide. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about that. What do you see in as far as conflicts going on in the world? I mean, what's is it, are the is it starting to slip? Are we starting to see everything come unraveled? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we need we need essentially two things to maintain this set of living arrangements. We need fossil fuels and we need grains. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going on in Ukraine? Take a look around. Grains all over the place. Among the last places where you can continue to grow grains at a very large scale. And fossil fuels. They got natural gas like it's going out of style. I, I'm absolutely convinced that we would not be there were it not for those two things. Interesting. That's why yeah. the United States goes to war everywhere. Oh, it's not a war. It's a police action. Yeah. It's only a war if it's approved by Congress, and Congress never approves this stuff because they want to keep their hands clean or whatever. Yeah, and so it's all police actions since World War II. Yeah. It, I mean, imagine what Carlin would do that would do with that sort of thing. Yeah. It's not a war; it's a police action. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, he says you you call. You call Palestinian freedom fighters, you call them terrorists, but you call Israeli commandos uh, freedom fighters. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And they're doing the same thing. Hmm. If firefighters fight fire, then what do freedom fighters fight? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I almost had Kelly Carlin on the show. I was trying to get her on the show and, uh, I were in, in emailing with her and she's, she's tough. It's been a year and I still, she's like, oh, maybe next month. I was like, okay, I'll keep okay. trying. Is that a political figure? That's uh George Carlin's daughter. Oh, oh, okay. I should yeah. know that. There are that, things I should know. Yeah. She's great. So she's I don't. Yeah, she's actually, I think, picks up a lot where her dad left off and a lot of the things that she does, but she's very Buddhist and uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, into heal, self healing, and she's also got a cute little dog. So, but yeah, we're gonna try to get her on the program too. If it weren't for self healing, there'd be very little healing around the world. I'm telling you, right? I'm telling you. I mean, if you don't take care of yourself first, yeah. the, the flight attendants had it right all along. Put on your own mask first. Don't help your children first. You have to help <laughs> yourself first. Put on your own mask. Then you'll be able to throw the children out the emergency <laughs> at the door. I don't give a fuck about the kid. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, what, what, what do you think are the things that you can do? What, I mean, what's your secret to you can meditate or you eat? You just eat BLTs. Obviously, that's a big part of <laughs> staying. To maintaining this unbelievably poor quality of health that I have. Is that your, what you're asking about? Well, poor quality of, you know, mental outlook on. Oh. I mean. Well, uh, physically, I'm not in great shape. My back is killing me. I've been to a spine uh, doctor. That's all he works on is the human spine at Dartmouth, which is a renowned college, right? So I go see this guy. It's only about a 45 minute drive from here and he's tried everything. He's, he, he tried radiation therapy because if yeah. you kill the nerves, then you won't be in pain, right? It also applies to using a gun and then you don't, <laughs> but he, so I far heroin. He, he hasn't suggested that route. <laughs> so he used radiation therapy to kill the nerves. Didn't help. Wow. Are you kidding me? My nerves are superpowers. And then he, let's see, he tried this other thing, epi, epidural, epidural oh, right. shots, yeah. which I thought was only for pregnant women, but apparently not. Or maybe he's yeah. confused about who I am. Anyway, <laughs> it's a busy life for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so physically, I'm not in great shape. So yeah. I try to counteract the constant pain I'm in by a couple of means. I meditate a lot and I do back exercises all day because the only thing that gives me very temporary relief from my pain is to do these back exercises. Mm. Fortunately, we have this ottoman, this ottoman that is 20 inches off the ground. So I don't have to go down to the ground because there's some danger that I may, might never get up again. Right, right, right. So, yeah. So, so I go down to the ottoman with the well padded ottoman. I do my back exercises 20 times a day. And then I meditate when I'm trying to sleep. That's Holy about it. Shit. Yeah, I, know, I look, thank God you haven't started just drinking a bottle of whiskey every day to, you know, wait, I need to write this down. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Jeffrey says bottle of scotch. Week. I'm actually, I'm taking a break from the scotch, but uh, it can help a lot with certain conditions revolving, right. revolving around physical and mental health, but it does have its drawbacks. But yeah, when I'm it, surprised was, it didn't give you pills. When I was 18. Yeah. Well, he gave me pills. He gave me pills and pills and pills and pills and pills, multiple versions of different kinds of pills. And, yeah. And and I every time I'd look up to see what the side effects were, this latest one that I just finished yesterday, so I know I survived it. The latest one includes side effects include every imaginable thing, including death. Yeah. That's that a side a, effect. That that's the like ultimate the side effect. effect. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's no side anything. It's not. It's the main thing. You're you're it, dead. It causes constipation and diarrhea at hopefully the same not, time. Hopefully not at the same time, because <laughs> that would be insane. Yeah, <sighs> I bet you I get the worst mental image because right? I've heard that before. You get diarrhea and constipation. How would that work? It's just like water First, dripping around a brick. <laughs> Fortunately, the only side effect I got from the whole thing is dry mouth. <laughs> Drink your water. I'm drinking uh, water all day, every day. Pills. I mean, pills are the cure for everything. If your neighbor's dog is barking too much, you can't sleep at night. Take some pills. You won't care. You know, care. when I was growing up in this small village, the solution to everything like that was a gun. 
shoot the dog. <laughs> well, I think so. Nobody ever mentioned whether it was the dog or the dog's owner or whatever. But right? the, the gun was the problem solver. Yeah, oh, of course. When I was a kid, the gun was the problem solver for everything. <laughs> Domestic I kid uh, troubles? Time, I was a kid a long time ago, and I grew up in this benighted village. So I didn't know anything, you know, and it was just, it was the time. Yeah. And somehow was safer than today. That's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little crazy. And people smoking in the grocery store, holding a cabbage and like chain smoking and like checking out all the produce. We were healthier then. Right. Yeah. I was I was sucking down secondhand smoke my entire life. My dad put smoke three packs a day. Oh yeah. Every day. He came home from his principal or superintendent job and he drank a six pack of beer before he even sat sat down. Holy and things smokes. were better then from a health perspective. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did have this army of like dads who would just drink, watch Joe Namath drink, you know, to a right. great excess and chain smoke and then never move and just sit and get like the, the huge belly and then die of a heart attack. <laughs> that's like my prototypical 50s dad starter pack, you know, it's like, that's what you had to do. Beat the, beat the wife, tell her to get in the kitchen and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Right. You, and you yet know, we were healthier. Right. <laughs> and in those days, they didn't call those shirts wife beater shirts, by the way. What were they called? That, that came later. I don't know what they called them. Probably tank tops. Something. Yes, tank tops. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have a word for it. Tank, the wife beater. <laughs> yes. What is that? What does that say about our entire society when we yeah. name a shirt a wife beater? Yeah. Because... Because 12 people used to beat their wives when they were wearing them. They yeah. got caught on camera. It must have been either that or on Cops or on like uh, oh, a yeah. movie, something like this. But yeah. <laughs> it became synonymous with beating your wife. Because if you're going to beat your wife, at least you better be comfortable and stylish. So where? <laughs> Why would you have it any other way? <laughs> yeah. But yet, and yet, we were healthier then. I don't, that's so mind-boggling because it's like, yeah, I just read today, uh, there is proof now that uh, kids are becoming in puberty faster. And I'm so glad I don't have kids. But uh, over the last four decades, kids are going into puberty earlier and earlier. And, and they think it's because of A, obesity, and B, like microplastics, and I forget what else they said, but just... It, it's got to be the drugs that are in everything, too, doesn't it? I would think so. I, I mean, mean... There's everything. Yeah. You, you're Na drinking name water? Some, yeah, you name think some you're things. drinking water? No, you, you're drinking heroin, mescaline, everything. You got everything in that cup right there. That's why it's black. Mm. I love it. Mm. <laughs> you can really taste the MDMA, is it? Mm. <laughs> I did. I heard a podcast with somebody said, uh, we've got, they did tests in the UK in some like local river that was next to where people had a festival and stuff. And there was just cocaine, MDMA, uh, birth control, you know, all the fun stuff. It was just oh, in, right. the, in the water. Right, right. Well, oral contraceptives are in everything. They're in, in every glass of water you drink. Ooh. Uh, and, and, I, that's and I don't even need it. <laughs> yeah that's what you think <laughs> <laughs> i'm practicing abstinence already uh, no i uh, fucking last thing i want to do is have a kid holy god i'm gonna be very very careful what i i can't wait till i'm very old and there's just no chance at all um, because that's uh, really like that's a suicide right that's a kamikaze mission yes absolutely but isn't that what we do? Yeah. Do you, do you find people? that? Yeah. Do you find that there's even a concerted effort among the establishment or like governments or like corporations to like keep pushing us to have kids against our will? Yeah. Well, at least in this country, the tax system benefits you for having children. Why do you think? What is that for? 
because the tax system and everything else about this country dates to a few years ago when the whole idea was to colonize the world, starting mm -hmm. with the Western United States and including all those territories, right, that we claim as our own, but don't allow anybody to vote. <laughs> So we still have this colonial mentality in a world where that stopped working a hundred years ago. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm sure you're familiar with the population bomb it came out in 1968. Yeah. First, first literature on the subject. Yeah. Right. Written by Paul Ehrlich and Anne Ehrlich, but her name wasn't on it because a woman couldn't possibly know anything about contraception and population. That was the view of the publisher. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you couldn't make this up. Seriously. Uh, that's horrible. I mean, the right. same with the, with the poor the, the lady that does. Well, Watson and Crick discovered the DNA helix, and then the Rosa, what was her name? Rosalind something. Of course, I don't know her name because I'm a stupid white male colonialist piece of shit, but I'm, pr I'm pretty sure she. Somebody got there before. She Watson. had the data, and they just came up on the desk. They were like, oh, it looks, what's this papers here? Look, oh, shit, she's on to something. Let's take this. <laughs> oh, we better fire her, by the way. Yeah, or yeah. at least her in charge of childcare. <laughs> yeah, make demote her to be a secretary and get her the fuck out of here. <sighs> they don't call them secretaries anymore, by the way. What do they call them? They they call them. <laughs> Look at us so far from the bureau jobs. We're like I don't remember what they call them. Assistants, <laughs> right? Like a person administrative assistant. Okay. Yeah. Whew. We. We come off the mountain. We're like, do they still call them stewardesses? It's like, no, you've, you're, you got, get with the times. Like, can I still call people retarded? No, you can't. <laughs> Dang. All right. I guess I'm going back to the woods. Bye. <sighs> oh, yeah. All right. Well, look, let's, we did an hour. Let's, it's been too long. Let's do this again. What do you say? Sure. Yeah. I, I it was a long year, and I just didn't I didn't want to bother you. But we we should do more often. Well, we should check in. Well, and you take the right approach by not looking at the comments. <laughs> yeah, I have somebody else do that shit. If they're bad, <laughs> delete them. If they're good, tell me maybe. tell me one of the good ones, maybe. But at the same time, what do I? I'm sitting here saying I don't care about human beings, but I care what they think. No, I don't care what they think. <laughs> But it is it, it is a reminder how stupid humanity is if you go to any comment section and realize what people have to say. Speaking of stupid, do you know about Ethelism? No. Ethel is life spelled backwards. And and there's somebody on YouTube, this idiot character, and, and he's the superstar of the movement. He's he goes on YouTube and he makes all these videos about just kill yourself. But don't just kill yourself, kill everybody. <laughs> kill everything. <laughs> He's a fan of no life on earth ever, <laughs> but he's been doing this for like 10 or 15 years. So he's still charging ahead. Oh. And by the way, he doesn't use his own name. Nobody knows his name because why would he reveal himself? He's an idiot. God, I like that. That is good. <laughs> Maybe I should go that way. I want to do some satirical kind of take on that. Like, you know. And they always give us a hard time. They say, well, if you hate humans so much, why don't you just kill yourself? It's like, yeah, nah, no, that doesn't quite work like that. No, no, no. I don't like other humans. I like yeah. me. I like me just fine. It's just about all you other motherfuckers that don't <laughs> care about me and how I feel. Right. You're the problem. Yes. Exactly. You got now this. I, now I feel like I'm going to read Ayn Rand book or something. Like I'm sort of selfish or something. And I don't want to go that route, but... <laughs> Now, if we can't be nice oh. to each other, what's the point? So this is how bad it is. This Ethelism guy actually got to an acquaintance, and he killed himself. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and he was married. He had kids. Well, you can't yeah, do that. That's a shame. You know, I... Uh, 
it's hard for me to take issue with people who kill themselves, given the pain and suffering that so many people experience. Sure. Okay, so I get that. Yeah. But if you got somebody in your life who cares about you, no, no, you can't do that. You, yeah. I, by by decree of Guy McPherson, you do not do that. <laughs> yeah. You do not show yourself. Come well, on. It, that's a good. That's a good philosophy because look, you're here to. It's not just about you, and that's a perfect example of how life isn't just about you. And if you want to just take the easy way out, that you have to remember that. There are people, selfishly, I might add, need you in their life. And I think that that's a calling, right? Everybody should respect life, at least to that degree. But there are some miserable sons of bitches out there that really ain't got nobody. I had a friend send me something. He sent me this sensationalized article. It says there He always sends me like the conspiracy theorist stuff, really editorializes. It says, they're, <laughs> they're, they're euthanizing people in Canada now that have low credit scores. And I go... <laughs> <laughs> and I go, okay, let me look at this a little bit closer. Let me see what this is all about. Turns out that they're, they're, they made suicide legal for people that want to commit suicide. And a lot of them aren't terminally ill. They're just miserable sons of bitches. And, and so it, it's, it's brings up all this conversation with everybody like, Oh, that's, that's spooky. That's weird. And, it's kind of spooky, kind of weird, but at the same time, if people want to take their own lives, eh, what are you going to do? Well, also, you misspoke there. I'm, I'm sure you didn't mean it this way, but birth is lethal, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody has a terminal condition. Right. You have a terminal condition. Now, I yeah. don't know when you're going to die, and you don't need – it would be great if it was stamped on our foreheads, right? But we couldn't yeah. see it. Say, let me so, see if I have enough time to do that. No, it looks yeah. like I'm. No, you can't see your own. You can only see other people's. So oh, I can really? only. See, yeah, I can see on your. I can see on your head, right? February twenty second, twenty twenty four, and I'm like, I'm not going to stand next to him. I'm a little too close right now. Yeah. <laughs> and people would be wondering, you're like, I, you looking at my forehead, and you're like, I'm wondering why are you so nice to me right now? It's like he's going to die tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so nice to me? Ask me tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they made me all kinds of wild promises to next week. I'm a little suspicious. <laughs> We're going to take you to Disneyland. <laughs> hey. Sure you are. Yeah, that'd be frightening. <laughs> um, well, yeah, we'll right. come you, back you next week. You keep trying to wrap this up, and I keep. Well, I, I, it's good to hear from you. I mean, this this is so natural and so fun. So, I, if people watch it, people don't. I don't really give a fucking rant it behind. Um, but uh, people, you know, subscribe, like, and everything, do all that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, come back next week. We'll do this again. That'd or in the great. coming weeks, you know. Yes. Yes. Whenever you have time. All right. Look forward to uh, it. Uh, anything you want to say before we sign off to all these uh, troglodytes in TV land? Well, you can find my work at guymcpherson.com and in, including soon a link to this video. So that's all I got. If you want to know anything about my life, my life is an open book and it's at guymcpherson.com, which Wonderful. is a great place for it because then people know that, you know, it's my life instead of John Smith. <laughs> Somebody else's life. <laughs> Uh, Guy McPherson, wonderful human being. I'm Chris Jeffries, and anybody who's watching on his channel, come over. I'm the Homeless Romantic uh, Podcast. Uh, I'm just an idiot with a microphone who likes to talk and hear my <laughs> hear my sound of my own voice. Um, but uh, yeah, well, wishing you guys all the best, and uh, don't kill yourself if you have somebody out there who loves you. So, and that's that's it. Thank you, Chris. 